So Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to be <clears throat> starting in verse 13. Now, I, I'm probably, I don't know how long this went on for. I might be just really dating myself as I find it easier and easier to do now. Uh, but I grew up in church and as a young whippersnapper, went to Crusaders. Anybody went to or remembers Crusaders in church? Yes, thank you. All right, a few of us. Crusaders was like the Christian Boy Scouts, Girl Guides. It was the first like gender-inclusive thing. It was boys and girls together. Uh, we were politically correct when we didn't know what that was. But we were all together, and we would work on different things to get you know badges for your sashes. And of course, one of those things that you do was memory verses. And this right here, I think, was one of the first verses that I memorized as a young believer, Ephesians 6, verse 13. Wherefore, take unto the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And I'm sitting there as a young believer, thinking, what in the world is this evil day that's coming our way, and why are they enlisting a bunch of young people to fight this battle? Where's all the adults? Why am I getting put on the front lines here? I don't know if I want to be doing that. When is this evil day coming? And so, you know, we're reading through this not knowing what this is all about. Well, Paul here today is going to be looking to instruct us and fill this in a little bit more for us because we need to understand as, as we've been going through this, we recognize that we are in a battle as believers, you would think and you would love, if you're like me, you would hope that Paul, as he's winding down the letter, as we've been talking about where we sit in the heavenly places in Christ, the blessings that we have as believers, as we are instructed in our walk with the Lord, how great it is just to know this life he's given us, and now we get to live it for him. You would think Paul would just end on a very comfortable note and say, so guys, just enjoy this new life in Jesus. Life is just going to be great. No, he doesn't do that. He goes, and by the way, there's an enemy. He's out to get you. You're in a battle. Good luck with that. I'm out. That's kind of what Paul does now in the book of Ephesians. And we're like, wait a second. What happened to all that other good stuff that was so encouraging and helpful? Well, Paul's not writing this to scare us. He's writing this to to equip us, to uh, get us ready because as he instructs us in this new life in Christ, we need to be aware that as we go out into the world, we're walking into enemy territory. There's a real enemy and, and, and Paul names him there in verse 11 as he tells us that we need to put on the whole armor of God that he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That's who Paul says, this is your enemy. He's at work. The word devil in the Greek is diablos, and it means the slanderer or accuser. He's also named Satan. Revelation 12, 9 says that he is the accuser of the brethren. He's, he's an adversary. That's what the name Satan means, an adversary. And he's one that's out to oppose us, to destroy us, to knock us down. But this is why Paul is saying all through this passages that we've been in, Ephesians 6 here, from verse 10 on, says simply to do this, stand your ground. Stand your ground, guys. The battle's been won. Jesus has already defeated the enemy, but we're still living in this time period right now before Christ's return, before we're with Christ, where we're living in this world, we're conducting ourselves in this world with the ruler of the world, which is the devil, who's still having sway in this world and, and among people. You might think, why, 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 God, did you not just kind of destroy him and throw him in the lake of fire already? That's going to come in a future day, but why are you letting him just be? Right? You can get frustrating at times. You just knock him out. But see, there's something too that happens as the Lord allows the enemy to do his work. It's first of all, I mean, you could spend a, a whole year on a series on this. I'm not going to cover it all, but simplic in its simplicity, you can say that the Lord is allowing there to be opposition because there needs to be choice. He wants people to serve him or not, and there has to be an option. But also what happens is as the enemy is at work, 
It teaches us, it helps us when there is opposition to be able to be strengthened in the Lord and to be able to stand our ground. Without resistance, what happens? We become very weak. We become very susceptible to getting knocked around, pushed over. It's like trees. You look at some trees and um, with the wind blowing against them, they develop stronger, deeper roots in the ground that enable them to stand up against the opposition or the pressure of the wind. I mean, don't use the trees in my yard as an example. My neighbor, Brandon, was just having to tie one up here to another tree because it was totally falling over another. And that tree is not the illustration you want to use, but there's other trees that stand better in the ground. And with the wind, they become stronger. It's like when you go to the gym. You're not just picking up two pound weights like what I like to use in my uh, work, but you're picking up weights that are going to provide resistance, that are going to provide some pressure because you're going to get built up strength. And that's why sometimes, uh, that's why the Lord's allowing this to, to be happening in the world. But he says, stand your ground. And he not only tells us stand your ground, he gives us now equipment to stand your ground. He gives us something that we need to be able to stand up against the wiles of the devil, as it says, the attack, the opposition of our accuser and slanderer. So we're gonna be looking at that here this morning. We're gonna see the key to the keys to the battle. We see the equipment, but we're also gonna look at the equipping and then we'll see the encouragement. Paul does end with encouragement. Don't worry, he's not just kind of saying, ah, good luck with the battle. He does end with some encouragement here for us. But look at verse 13. Again, it says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. So take up the whole armor of God. He said in verse 11, to put on the whole armor of God. Understand this here, that God's given us armor and we're going to go through these we're going to talk about that he's given us armor but it's our job to put it on it's our job to take it up god doesn't sit there and close and, and put it on and say okay put this on this way and cinch this up tighten that god says here it is but you got to put it on and you got to put on the whole armor of god don't just be going out with a piece here a piece there I think today I need the belt of truth, but tomorrow maybe the belt. No, he says, put on the whole armor of God. Have it all on. Be equipped in this battle that's raging in the world that you're to be conducting yourself as light in the darkness. Put on the whole armor of God. How important that is. Nobody's going to be showing up. You think about people that are called over, like let's say to, you know, a desert storm was a thing, called over to the Middle East, to, but nobody's showing up there on the battle lines, you know, in their bathing suit, towel and flip-flops, thinking, man, it's going to be a hot day today. Are we going to be near a body of water by chance? Can I take a quick day? Nobody's showing up for battle like that. They're going, what do you got? Give it to me. I'm going on the front lines. You got more back there? Where's the, where's the supply tent? I need some more. I don't know, I'm already decked, right? You can't even see anything on me or you can't even see me, but I want more. Like you're gonna be equipped. And that's what Paul's saying. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand or withstand in the evil day. Now you might be thinking, what, what is that? What's the, when is, can you maybe let me know when that is? Then that way I'll be even more prepared. No, it's, we're living in the day. That's evil. It's an evil time because there's an evil force at work in the world that the Lord is allowing to do a thing, but he's not having, Satan doesn't have full reign. God's still in control, but God's allowing Satan to do his work right now for a purpose. God's working his purpose to do that. We're living in an evil day, and so we need to be prepared now every day. We wake up, we have to recognize, okay, I'm in Christ, praise the Lord. I have all that I need, but I'm living in an evil day. And I need to be prepared. I need to be ready. I need to be understanding that because if you don't, see, here's what the enemy loves you to think, that there's really no enemy, that the days are good. You don't have to worry. That's what the enemy would love you to think. And remember, we're we're fighting in a spiritual realm, Ephesians 6, 12, 
it, our, our battle is not flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers, the darkness. So Satan is at work, but he's at work in a way where he wants you to think there's no worry, there's no threat, there's no problem. But Paul says, oh no, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day that you're living in now. Paul said earlier in, in verse 16 of chapter five, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. So we need to put on the whole armor of God here. And, and Paul now begins to share and clarify what this armor is. And here's the great thing. Paul's sitting in jail, right? He's sitting in a, in a Roman prison. He's, he's chained to a Roman soldier. So Paul's able to look over and go, hey, you know what, I could really use you right now. Could you just model a little bit for me? Do a little turn for me here. I wanna see what you've got on. Like he's just kinda of looking at this guy, you know. What do you got there? What's that thing called? And he's going, you know, I wanna apply some of these things to the Christian life. It's not that these things represent, literally mean those things, but he's saying, I wanna apply what you got on and say, this would be a fitting picture to share with believers now that I wanna, I wanna tell them how they can be equipped. So Paul starts to kinda of look at this Roman soldier he's chained to and just start to go through these things. He says in verse 14, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So there's a Roman soldier in his attire here. There's the armor that Paul is looking at here. He starts to go through each of these ones and he says, first of all, let's take that belt that he got on. Let's apply that to truth, how we need to be putting on this, this belt of truth, girding our waist with truth. In everything we do, we wanna be sure that we are moving forward in truth and in God's truth that we have through the word of God. We'll get to that in a little bit here as another part of the armor dealing with the word of God. But understand that everything that this soldier had on was ultimately tied to that belt. Some of you know, man, I can't, I can't leave my house without my belt. <laughs> God, on my belt, we're gonna get in some embarrassing situations if I don't have my belt on and cinched up tightly, right? Maybe some of you, I don't know. I've, I've, okay, anyways. But the, that belt, everything tied to it, connected to it. It kept everything in place. It's the same for us. If we're not connected to the truth, tied to the truth, then we're gonna be, we're gonna be susceptible to the enemy's attacks, to the enemy coming against us, things are gonna quickly unravel for us if we're not those that are tied, connected to the truth. Because Satan, he, he's called the father of lies. In fact, uh, Jesus in John 8, 44 says, speaking to the religious leaders, you are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you wanna do. He was a murderer from the beginning, does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. He's a father of lies. Jesus said in John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. How important that is for us to be making sure that we are tied to the truth that we know the truth, and that everything we do in life is connected to the truth. Don't take out a part and go, well, that doesn't really quite line up with the word of God, but that should be okay. It's not really a big deal. You want everything to be connected, tied to God's word, God's truth, everything you're doing to be founded, grounded in the word of God. Next, he says, take on and put on the, the breastplate of righteousness now, the breastplate of righteousness. Not only is Paul drawing from Rome, a Roman soldier and Roman imagery, but he's also, I think, got Old Testament scripture in mind because it says in Isaiah 59, 17, so fitting. Looking at the, the coming of Christ, he says, for he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the, the garments, sorry, I lost that one. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing. He was clad with zeal as a cloak. Speaking of Jesus, that was to come, that breastplate of righteousness. So Paul says, we need that breastplate of righteousness. You know what Satan loves to do in the life of the believer? He loves to come and bring condemnation. <clears throat> he wants to beat you down. He wants you to think, you're not worthy. You're not good enough. You think God's actually gonna 
accept you and forgive you of your sin? You think God's gonna do that work? How, no show of hands, but I'm sure many of you sitting here have experienced that onslaught of the enemy trying to attack you in that way. And this is why Paul says, man, you gotta put on that breastplate of righteousness that, that protected all those vital organs, that protects everything that the enemy would love to try to get away in to say, you know what? Oh, I know I'm not worthy. I know I'm not deserving, but guess what, Satan? You big jerk. Jesus died for me, and he clothed me now in his righteousness by my faith in him. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 20, that he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become what? The righteousness of God in him. How good is that? So that we can now stand up against the enemy coming with condemnation, with doubt to say, oh man, I know I mess up. I know I'm not perfect, but I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ through my faith in him, through his work done, completed on the cross at Calvary. Now, not only is there a positional righteousness that we have imputed to us through Christ, but there's also practical righteousness where the word says how we are to live out acts, works of righteousness. As believers, our desire should be to live a righteous life. We don't do it to be saved, we do it because we are saved. Because we have been given a positional righteousness, we now desire to walk in a practical righteousness to say, I want to walk in a manner worthy, like Paul says, worthy of the calling with which we've received in Christ. And you see, when we're walking in a practical righteousness, man, there begins to be a whole lot less area for Satan to try to get his hooks in, to try to throw those fiery darts See, if we're walking in just positional righteousness, Satan can go, well, look at you. There's no demonstration of that in your life. You're living just like the rest of the people in the world are. What's the difference? But if we're walking in a, in a practical righteousness, doing works of righteousness, suddenly now there's a lot less that Satan has against us. The righteous living of the believer becomes an, an impenetrable protection from the enemy's accusations. Next, we come upon verse 16, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I love that. Great old word, shod. Tell your kids one morning, hey kids, you got your feet shod before you go out today? See what they say. <laughs> what are you talking about? Shod. <laughs> that's, but that's the idea here where you are, are prepared to go out and, and we prepare ourselves going out with what? The gospel of peace. The gospel of peace, just like shoes for your feet become a good foundation for what you do, right? So too the gospel of peace becomes that foundation for us to build ourselves on and, and to move forward in the world with and in and through the gospel of peace. Now, Roman soldiers, they had these great sandals, not great battle attire, right? I mean, Nike wasn't in business then. They're not getting these nice shoes or boots that are ready, sandals. But what made it even more uncomfortable for them is they put nails through them that would give them good tread on the battleground. It was, again, a great you know, strategy and, and help for Roman soldiers, which made them so great. But so, too, it's the gospel of peace that gives us that traction in the world today. Sometimes we think, again, well, we got to get out there and we got to, we gotta find the enemy, we gotta expose, we gotta get out there and we gotta fight against this person or that person that we think is an ambassador of the enemy. We gotta really go on. You know what, it's the gospel of peace that brings traction for believers in the world. It's just revealing who Jesus is and what he's done for us, providing that avenue and that hope of peace that people in the world need to hear. That's what plucks them out of darkness. That's what begins to break down the strongholds of the enemy. When we begin to provide the good news in the world, that's what brings traction for the believer. Have your feet prepared with the gospel of peace. And then, verse, uh, where are we? Verse, oh, 16, we're still in 16, with which, oh, there it is. I said verse 16 before, verse 15 was the feet. Now it's 16, above all. Thank you for just bearing with me on that little moment there I had. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. 
a shield of faith. Man, this is what anybody going into battle is really going to want to have. You can show up on the battlefield, you got your nice, shiny breastplate of righteousness, you may have that belt cinched up, but if you don't have a shield, you're going to feel very vulnerable. And this is no ordinary shield. This is no like Captain America, a little frisbee that you throw around. This was a shield that was like two and a half feet wide by four feet tall. It's like just kind of holding one of me up in front of you, right? It's like my stature, two and a half feet wide, four feet tall. And it's like, it's just like that shield that you would suddenly begin to just be able to completely hide yourself behind, protect yourself behind, and allow yourself not even to be seen by the enemy. Shield of faith. It's a shield of faith that we need. When we go into the battleground, when we suddenly begin to see, like what verse 16 tells us here, fiery darts of the wicked one coming against us, guess what that can do? It can cause us to freak out. Oh my goodness! There's artillery flying at us. There's things coming against you. Ah! But shield of faith that says, oh, hold on. Not, not saving faith, but faith in the power of the Lord. Faith in the fact that God has already won the victory and he's gonna see me through this present battle that I'm in right now. It's faith to know and believe that I'm safe in and through the Lord. That I don't have to fear what I see in front of me because I don't walk by sight, I walk by faith. I'm trusting the Lord. I'm believing in what God's able to do for me. That's that shield of faith that we hold up in front of us. And it begins to extinguish all the fiery darts of the enemy or the fiery arrows that they would throw. You see, this shield was made of wood, but it was overlaid with leather. And they would dip that shield in water so that when those fiery arrows came and even stuck into it, boom, they'd suddenly go out. It had no bearing, it had no no effect on the soldiers that had that shield in front of them. So too for us, when we have that shield of faith, man, the enemy might, might come with all the, the weaponry he's got, throwing those arrows, but we're like, ah, eh, nothing. I got faith in the Lord. And he who is with me is greater than he that is in the world. I love what Jahaziel said to King Jehoshaphat and to the rest of Israel. Is there, they've got armies coming against them. He says there in 2 Chronicles 20, 17, you will not need a fight in the battle. Position yourselves, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear, be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Peter says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, right? He walks by like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, but resist him, how? Steadfast in the faith. Steadfast in the faith, resist him. So that shield of faith. And then, moving on, we see next in verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, that helmet of salvation. Again, boy, you wanna have your head protected, right? I mean, a, a lot of us that grew up, right, riding bikes, jumping skateboards over like 10 foot jumps, no helmet, right? So anybody like, you know, 40 and over, you got to give every one of those a break. They're all dealing with like post-concussion syndrome. They've got a little bit of brain damage going on, right? I mean, we did nothing with helmets on. Now we know the importance. It's like, you don't let little Johnny go anywhere on your side without a helmet on, right? Where are you going? You're walking to your neighbor. Get a helmet on. What are you doing? Tree branch could fall on you, you silly. Get a helmet. Everybody got a helmet on. And you know what you have now with people ride, riding their bikes with helmets on? You just see, I think, more crashes. They're all like, I don't care. What's going on? And it's like, riding along. What's going on? What are you saying, Mom? Boom, like crashing into a mailbox. It's like, I got a helmet on. It's okay. <laughs> Anyways, but <clears throat> helmets, what I'm trying to say is, what am I trying to say? I don't know either. I have no idea what I'm trying to say. I think what I'm trying to say is helmets are important. <laughs> I think that's what we're getting to. Helmets are important. You want a helmet. Helmet of salvation is super important because here's what happens. The enemy comes against you and again, he wants to, the mind becomes the playground for the devil. The mind is where, again, working in that spiritual realm where he comes in, he whispers doubts. 
to you, makes you question, you, you're not really a child of God. God, God isn't really gonna you know, give you eternal life, is he? he can't have that. If I, look at what you just did last week. Man, you're, you're just gonna be easy. No, we need to have the helmet of salvation that says, oh no, wait a second, I'm a child of God, and that is irregardless, or regardless, it's not even a word, irregardless. My wife will tell me about that after if I say that, but it's not irregardless, it's just regard, regardless of what I might have done, I'm saved, I'm a child of God. It's because it's not because of what I've done, it's because of what he's done. He's done the work to save me. So I put on that helmet of salvation that no matter what the enemy might try to tell me, I just simply say, no, I'm, I'm a child of God. I'm saved because my faith is in him. I love what, I don't know who, who said it to begin this, but it's a good saying that when the enemy comes to remind you of your past, just remind him of his future. It's not gonna go well for him. He's on borrowed time right now. He knows it. That's why he's on such a, an, an onslaught because he's like, man, I got little time. And I want to bring as many down with me as I can. That's his only mission in life. And so we need to put on that helmet of salvation by which we say, Satan, man, I, I may have done some bad things in the past. I may not be perfect now but my faith and trust is in Jesus and he's done that work of salvation in my life and how we need to protect our mind because the enemy wants to play there. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity under the obedience of Christ. Because of our salvation, all things are, are, are temporary. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love or the life that we have in Christ. We don't need to doubt our inevitable victory. Romans 8, 31 says, if God is for us, who can be against us? We're saved, we're his. And he's for us. Then we got the sword of the spirit. Now, sword of the spirit, the Romans kind of invented or began to use a very, what Paul's identifying here is this very short sword. Typically in battle, people have these long swords, sharp on one side. These short swords were like, sharp on both sides and just really able to, you know, do some damage. Interestingly, all the armor that we've seen so far is all simply defensive stuff. You don't go on the offense with a shield or a breastplate, right? You're not like doing chest bumps to people to try to knock him down. You're not, they're not offensive armor. This is the only offensive armor we have, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Paul's like, Listen, <clears throat> you should already know sword of the spirit. I'm gonna make that very clear. He writes in, this is the word of God that we're talking about here. And this is where, again, truth comes in, where we understand the importance of the word of God in standing strong in the battle we're in, but also doing away with the enemy. See, the enemy loves to come in and challenge, question, make you doubt the word of God. It's the oldest trick in the book. Literally, it's what, it's what the enemy came and did to Eve. Remember back in Genesis chapter three. Um, Genesis three says this. Now, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Interesting. How did Satan come and tempt Eve? Saying, did God really say? Is that really what God said? Now, Eve needed to know the word a little bit better. Because she says, oh, we shall not eat of it, nor touch it, Let's, uh, but that's not what God said. God said he didn't, he didn't say anything about touch. He just said, don't eat of it. Maybe Satan came along and said, really? Well, try it, Eve. Just go ahead, touch it. Look it. It's fine. Nothing's happening. Eve maybe touches it goes, oh, yeah. I can't, maybe, maybe I misunderstood. Maybe, maybe that word was wrong. And Satan will love to come against you and cause you to doubt, question the word of God. And he'll do so very, very tactfully 
in a way where, again, he's the father of lies. He's a master at twisting things around. And sadly, there are so many today that have bought into that, that have bought into devaluing the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, by saying, well, you know what? Word of God is great. Got some great stories. We can learn from those, but it's not really the authority of God. It's not really the, you know, inerrant Word of God. And there are churches that promote that. There are believers that are no longer recognizing the power of the Word of God. And they're no longer able to stand strong because they don't understand that this is the weapon we use to fight against the enemy to say, I'm not going to listen to you any longer. This is exactly what Jesus did when Satan came to Jesus in the, in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 nights, tempting him. And there, Luke chapter 4 records for us that the enemy came challenging Jesus. What did Jesus do? Oh, Hey, Satan, it's written. It's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It's written, you shall not tempt the Lord. It's written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him alone. It is written, Jesus said. Here's the thing, Satan knows the word of God, but he loves to twist it around. That's why it's important that you know the word of God. Does Satan know the word of God better than you do? I hope not. That's why we need to be daily just in the word of God and getting the word of God into us and realizing the power that we have in the sword of the spirit, in the word of God to take down the enemy. I love the story in, in 2 Samuel 23 verse 10 with David's mighty men and tells this great battle that's, that's going on and it tells us that Eliezer fought valiantly in that battle until his hand froze to his sword. And that's what I wanna be like as Christians where I'm just so, I got such a, a, a clutch on this word that i just like, man, I can't let it go. My hand is just frozen to the sword of the spirit, the word of God, where I just, this just becomes a part of me, right? It's just like everything I do, whatever I'm saying, it's just, it's just the word of God, it's just a part of me. And that's the heart here that I wanna have. Well, we see <clears throat> the equipment that we've been given again. What are we called to do? Put it on. Every day, guys. Every day. Put it on. And then Paul begins to lay out the equipping we have. We have the equipment, but now it's like we have this equipping or this energy that comes along with it. Paul says in verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Uh, Notice that, praying always. Paul says this, this is to be a daily attitude that we have, praying always. Paul would say elsewhere, pray without ceasing. You listen to that, you think about it, and you go, what? How in the world can I do that? I'm carrying a conversation with someone, I'm just like breaking a prayer, and they're like, what is going on with this person? It, praying always just means simply that you are in constant communion with the Lord. You're in that, living in that constant awareness of God's presence with you, and that accessibility of just communing with God, that in everything, you're just like, man, Lord, this is great. What a great day. Lord, there's a guy I think's got road rage beside me. Would you just... Just help him, Lord, not to cut me off again, you know, and just praying as you're driving in the car, you see somebody on the street that's in, Lord, just pray. You know, every time we drive by an accident, you know, my family, we're just like, Lord, pray. We just ask that you help those people right now. And, and, and we just, I mean, and then we'll, we'll stop to help too. I should have said that to begin with, but we don't just drive by. We, we pray and then we stop and help. Okay. And, and so we're just praying in everything, what we're doing, praying always. That's what we, that's the, the, the privilege we have now is, as being in relationship with the Lord. You see, sometimes I think we have this mentality like, you know, we'll pray when things are heavy. We'll pray when things are challenging. We'll pray when things are getting difficult. It's like, you know, Satan is coming against, we're like, hold on, Satan. I haven't been praying lately. Can you give me a second? I just wanna pray before we engage in battle. And Satan's like, oh, okay, yeah, all right, well, just let me know when you're ready, you know, and Satan's like over on the sides, you know, just sitting around, just saying, okay, you know, let me know, are you done yet? He's not gonna do that. He doesn't give you that time. We gotta be prayed up, we gotta be ready for when the enemy does come. We're like already on guard. 
We're already prayed up, pray always, Paul says. And pray with all prayer. In other words, he mentioned supplication in the spirit. There's all sorts of prayer we get to do, supplication, intercession. Thanksgiving is a part of prayer. Philippians chapter four reminds us of that. Supplication is praying for your, your needs. It's like, Lord, uh, supply, right? Supply what I need, supplication. Intercession, praying for others. Thanksgiving is such an important thing to do in prayer because so oftentimes we think, Prayer is like, Lord, I need you to do this, do that, take care of this for me, help me here. And it's like this laundry list we have for the Lord to do. But how we need to spend time just thanking him for who he is and what he's already done. Pray with all prayer, Paul says, being watchful to this end. That's one way that we're watchful, isn't it? Remember when Jesus brought the disciples with him into the garden? He says, watch and pray with me. Watch and pray. We're reminded of that constantly in the word. Watch and pray lest you fall into temptation. And how the disciples do, man, they, they're, they're caught snoozing. They're not watchful. And what happens when the enemy comes? What's Peter doing? Whipping out the sword, cutting off the ear. He's probably going for the head, but he's tired. He's got CP dust in. All he gets is the ear. And she's like, man, Peter, if you were praying and not seeping, maybe, you know, we would have been a bit more in sync and in tune here, right? Watch and pray. And he says, for all the saints. I love that. See, here's the wonderful dynamic that happens when we pray, is we suddenly get to link with millions of believers all around the world, and we get to pray for others. Sometimes we get so locked into our battle, our fight, woe is me, nobody knows the pain and the struggle I'm going through. Suddenly you begin to pray for people and you're like, oh my goodness, there's people like over in China that are getting imprisoned just because they are, you know, worshiping Jesus. They can't even do that publicly. There are people that are being executed for their faith. Suddenly I'm like, oh man, you know, like Satan came at me and said, you're not a very good Christian. And I'm like thinking, oh, end of the world. And there's people over here being executed for their faith. Suddenly I realized, man, my, my battle, my struggle is really quite light. But what I get to do now as a part of the battle is I get to pray with others. I get to link with others and join forces. And I begin to recognize I'm not alone in this fight. I'm not alone in the battle. There's others as I'm praying for, there's others praying for me. I was praying for you. See, the Romans developed this incredible strategy in fighting, right? It was called testudo. And, and with those shields that they'd have, what they would do is they would link together and they would begin to form the prototype of the army tank. It's right there. Isn't that awesome? And they would come together, they would march together so that when the enemy is throwing the arrows, trying to go over it, try to get somebody on the other side of the shield, suddenly there's shields all around them. They're fully protected. And they're going like, man, together, we become even more strong and strengthened and, and unified in this fight and battle that we're in. So awesome. That's what we get to do and experience in and through prayer. And then notice Paul says here, verse 19, and for me that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery, the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So here's Paul saying, man, pray with all prayer. And by the way, pray for me. Now, if I'm Paul, I'm sitting here thinking, here's, you know, in case you're not sure what to pray for, why don't you pray for me to get out of this jail? I want to be with you guys. I don't want to be in jail. Are you praying? Are you praying for me? Because I'm still here. That would be like the top of my list. But what does Paul say? Pray that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Paul prays for more boldness. And I'm sure the church at Ephesus is going, well, wait a second, Paul. Isn't it your boldness that got you into jail proclaiming the gospel? Paul's like, yeah, that's right. And Wherever I am, I just want to be even more bold to proclaim the gospel. Pray that, that the good news may go up, that people might receive this truth and receive salvation, that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. He says, I'm an ambassador in chains, but you know what? Right where I am, I want to be used of the Lord. He's got Roman soldiers on shift work coming in, being chained to him. It's like Paul's going, hey man, give me boldness because I've got an audience here with me and they can't go anywhere. <laughs> We're chained together. I get to share the gospel. 
pray that I have that boldness just to say what needs to be said to these people that they might be saved. That's Paul's prayer. Lord, whatever situation I'm in, whatever trial I might be going through, whatever I'm experiencing, give me boldness to be used of you right where I am. That's, that's our prayer here. That's what Paul's praying for himself. What a great example it is. And then we see here in verse 21, this great encouragement, but that you also may know my affairs and how I am doing. Take kiss a beloved brother and faithful minister, and the Lord will make all things known to you, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ. In sincerity, amen. And so again, amazing. Paul's heart to encourage. He's sitting in jail. I'm sure people are thinking about him. He's not saying, hey guys, can you come and comfort me? Like, I'm running low on care packages. Maybe send another one to me, right? Like, you guys, where are you? Comfort me. No, he's saying, man, I want to send word back to you to let you know what God's doing, that your hearts may be comforted. Isn't that amazing? This is the heart of Paul. He's in chains. He's in jail. Pray for my boldness, and I'm doing this right now that you may be comforted, that you may be encouraged. Again, sometimes that's why the Lord allows us to go through difficulty. Sometimes why the Lord leads us through trials is that we might be strengthened, we might be encouraged as we see the Lord's work in us, that we might comfort others. That's what Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, where God of all comfort may comfort you in every trial and tribulation you're in that you might comfort others with the comfort with which you've received by God. And Paul's doing just that now. And he mentions four great things, peace, love, faith, grace. Great things to end his letter on here now. Great things that we need in our lives, peace. That comes through, again, having salvation in the Lord. Not only do we have the peace of God, but we have peace with God. We get to have an audience before him now in relationship. We have this great love as we begin to understand his salvation and, and peace that we have. Suddenly we grow in just the love of God. And as we grow in the love of God, may we extend that love to others. May we continue on in faith. Despite what we see around us, may we understand that God's at work, that God is greater than all these things around us. May we continue on like that shield of faith, walking by faith and in faith. And may we accomplish all these things through the grace of God by which he gives us all things, things that we don't deserve. That's what grace is. And we continue on through and in the grace of God. Oh, may we be mighty soldiers for the Lord. May we be equipped with this great equipment and see the energy and the equipping through prayer. And may we continue on just being an encouragement in the world. As we're not out there to chop off heads. We're out there to bring the gospel of peace to people, to say, hey, this is what's gonna bring traction in the world, the good news of Jesus Christ. If you don't know that good news of Jesus Christ today, maybe you're watching online or you're here today, and the good news of Jesus Christ is simply that that. Well, the bad news is that we were sinners, born in sin. Every single one of us are guilty before God, unable to save ourselves, unable to do enough goodness in ourselves to be right with God. But that's where the good news comes in. God sent his son Jesus to come in this world to die on a cross, to pay the penalty for your sin, my sin, that by simply putting our trust in Jesus to forgive us of our sin, we are forgiven and we're given new life. Jesus died on a cross, but he rose again securing life and victory for us. That if we simply confess our sin and we say, Jesus, I need you to be my Lord and my Savior, he comes and he does that work instantly. You become, the Bible says, born again. You've been given new life in and through Christ. Life now, but life eternal. That when you die, you might spend eternity with Jesus in heaven. There's no greater offer that you will ever receive in life than the free gift of salvation. If you don't know that today, I pray, receive it. Call it to Jesus for him to forgive you and save you. And if you've done that, let us know in the church here. We'd love to follow up with you. All right, let's pray.
Heavenly Father, thank you for this time to, just to look at your word. And we've covered lots, but I pray that this would all sink in for us here individually and that we would apply these things and these truths, this very word to our heart, to our life. We're in a battle, but Lord, we don't fear, we don't worry, because we know you who is greater than everything that opposes us and comes against us. And it's in you, we have the victory. You've equipped us, you've given us the armor. May we put it on today, Lord. May we walk in it daily and may we stand strong, able to withstand in this evil day. And having done all, may we be found standing. We pray in your name, amen. Amen. Cool, come on up.